a good idea maybe from several points of view, but uh, trust me, I'm suffering as much from this as you are. So today I will talk about Fourier decay for limit sets. It's a Fourier decay. And since we have a rather small audience today who mostly seem to quite proficient in transfer operators, most of you actually more so than me. I will try to skip a lot of, you know, uh, background and introduction, and I'll just have to introduce some notation at some point. But I'll again try to make it minimal. So here is my convex co-compact hyperbolic surface, like on Wednesday. So I will basically continue the talk that happened on Wednesday and use a, the same notation. So lambda gamma in S1, or I can identify it with the S1 with the extended real line. This is the limit set. Mu is the Patterson-Sullivan measure on the set. And the dimension of the set and the, the you know, the, well, yeah, the, the dimension of the set is equal to delta. In fact, it's delta regular in the sense uh, that we had on Tuesday. So <coughs> let me give a couple definitions of objects. So maybe I'll do it here. So both definitions are, are properties of the specific convex co-compact quotient or the group, if you want. So I will say that this quotient satisfies fractal uncertainty principle with exponent beta. So this is the definition we had on Wednesday. But I'll simplify it a little bit. I'll put rho equals to 1, which doesn't make much difference. If we have the following operator bound, like that. So I'll just write it. Since I already discussed that before, for each chi, which is smooth compactly supported on S1 cross S1, take away the diagonal. And we had the specific integral operator, which I write usually this way. It's an integral operator with a kernel. This is the Euclidean distance minus 2i over h chi of y, y prime, f of y prime, dy prime. So what we knew before is that if you have this fractal uncertainty principle with exponent beta, that was a, I explained on Wednesday, then you get a gap, well, essential spectral gap of size beta. So that was the application of that guy. Now I want to introduce another definition, this time a Fourier decay. So another definition. So I will say that we have generalized Fourier decay. So I'll use another acronym that Michael used. And I'll call it GFD with exponent, well, to keep with the notation of the paper. Epsilon 1 is the exponent in my Fourier decay. What does that mean? Well, what this means is that for, so if for each function in, uh, you know, some regularity doesn't really matter, phi prime not 0 on lambda gamma, and each amplitude in, I think that regularity is enough here, so some reasonable amplitudes. We have the following estimate that the integral of the of this expression with respect to the Patterson-Sullivan measure is decaying at infinity. So that's the yes. Uh, it's a natural measure that's invariant on the limit set. Well, it's not quite invariant, it's equivariant. But so there is a natural way to construct a measure on the limit set that I'm not going to define. 
and it's the same. Yeah, so the Patterson-Sullivan measure in this case, that was proved by either Patterson or Sullivan or both, probably both, that this is really some constant times the Hausdorff measure of dimension delta. So the, hmm? I think that was Patterson, especially as dim dimension two right now we're talking, so that must be Patterson. So it's really the Hausdorff measure, and then we'll see later that this measure has nice equivariance with respect to, um, with respect to transformations in the group. In fact, maybe I'll write it here because I will use it anyway, that if I have an element of my group, gamma, that generates this quotient, then I know that the integral of f d mu for any function f on this limit set is equal to, so it's like a change of variables formula. Here we take f composed with gamma. And then if this was the Lebesgue measure, you would take gamma prime to which power? Well, to power 1. Well, here you take it to power delta. So in fact, if we had a compact hyperbolic surface, then the Patterson-Sullivan measure would just be the uniform measure. And that's just the basic change of variables formula. But here it satisfies this very nice equivariance property. Now, I should say, make a remark here. It's not very important, but it's nice to know that this generalized Fourier decay does imply a Fourier decay. You can take g equals to 1 and 5x equals to x. And so then you would know that the Fourier dimension of this limit set is at least 2 epsilon 1. So that's Basically, this is the definition of Fourier dimension. It's just the decay of, well, some measure supported on the limit set, but that's the most natural one. And as such, the Fourier dimension is always no more than the Hausdorff dimension or the box counting dimension. And so, in fact, we always have, so can only have this statement, uh, this when uh, epsilon 1 is no more than delta over 2. Not to say that this statement is true, but it certainly cannot be true for larger values of epsilon 1. So this is the upper limit, the absolute upper limit of how much Fourier decay we can expect. Okay? And that's, that's actually not, not difficult to, to prove that, that side of the inequality. Now, how are these two concepts related? So it turns out that Fourier decay can really get you um, fractal uncertainty principle, at least to some extent. Namely, if you have this generalized Fourier decay with epsilon 1, then um, you, this implies this fractal uncertainty principle with exponent beta, where beta is the following number, 1 half minus delta plus epsilon 1 over 2. Yes? Uh, well, here. Why is the two? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it has to do with the fact that this way the Fourier dimension is be always below the Hausdorff dimension. Okay. So that's the, uh, it's maybe not a good way to say it. But let's say if you take an interval 0, 1 with a Lebesgue measure, what's the Fourier decay? Hmm. Let's see. For, for Fourier transform of the indicator function 0, 1 is what? I guess a minus 1, 1. It's sine x over x, right? So that's actually, no, that's too much for your decay. Okay. Well, for, no, uh, that's right. For, no, for, 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 for sets of dimension less than 1, you can actually see that this is, it's the best you could hope for. There is a small computation. Basically, it just has to do with the fact that if this thing is decaying, you know what the infinity bound is. You know that it's, it's, it's z z 0. It's a probability measure. It's 0x equals to 0. And then you know, however, what the L2 norm of this guy is up to a certain range of frequencies because that corresponds to box counting dimension almost literally. And so just using these two statements, you see that you cannot have better decay than that because then your L2 norm would somehow be too small. So it's, it's, it's that. So that's, that's the correct exponent. That's the best possible exponent. Today, of course, we're just going to show it with small positive number. But it's nice to see where's, where's the limit of Fourier 
uh, decay method. So I should else actually maybe mention a couple things while we're talking about this Fourier decay or Fourier dimension is that <sighs> there exist fractal measures which have no Fourier decay. That was already mentioned a couple times in comments, but I'll say it again is that if you say take the mid-third Cantor set and you take the standard Cantor measure on that, that has no Fourier decay whatsoever. If you plug in psi equals to 2 pi times the power of 3, uh, the Fourier transform, I believe, would just be equal to 1 at this point. There's really no Fourier decay whatsoever. Yes, yeah, so Fourier dimension of that would be 0, while the Hausdorff dimension, of course, is rather large. Yes, Michael? Any chance that no hypercouples is actually optimal? We don't know. Probably, I mean, the good, good, good luck proving it. It could be. There is no. David Borthwick did some unofficial numerics, and it seems that for some range, it might they might have good Fourier dimension, like even the maximal one. But then, as usual, you know, things start oscillating a lot. And once once a graph oscillates a lot, you you don't really know how fast it decays. So we don't know. We have no idea how we would prove that. There are constructions of sets with maximal Fourier dimension, so where the Fourier dimension is equal to the Hausdorff dimension, so the Fourier transform will decays as fast as it really could. These are called Salem sets, but none of these constructions is any close to one of these sets that we need in practice. So this is really, to us, for now, it's just the theoretical upper limit of how far this could go, even in the somehow the best Fourier world possible. And there are certainly examples of sets which have no Fourier decay, and in fact, um, it's kind of funny that we will prove Fourier decay, and we will use somehow that our Cantor set is not a linear Cantor set somewhere in the process, because the statement that I'll formulate soon actually has, um, you know, it would be false for a linear Cantor set. All right. So l l let me just very briefly sketch a proof of that statement, because this is really a bo boring statement. If I say t is my is this guy like that. Then what I want is I want the norm of t. Well, the norm of t squared, operator norm, is the same as the norm of t star t. So that's, that's really kind of very basic harmonic analysis, uh, I don't know, tricks or methods. And then you can see that the operator t star t, if you just stare at it, you can see that it has kernel. It has an integral kernel, which I can call k of, let's say, y and y double prime. Why not? Which will look like what? Well, you have to put these two indicator functions here at y, here at y double prime. So that's just, if you think what this operator looks like. So this is just a computation. And then you have to take this integral expression and, well, you, you know, you just write it out. This is really just an explicit uh, consequence of this. And here you will have integral over S1 of, uh, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll call it this way. I'll explain what it is. Here, y, pr y, y prime, y double prime, y prime. Here is something with chi's, which uh, is slowly oscillating again. It's explicit, but I don't want to figure it out. And then here is the indicator function again on this Cantor set, dy prime, like that. And what's phi? Phi is just the phase function there. So I believe it's uh, either plus or minus, depending on which order I took. Maybe here it would be like that, twice log y minus y prime. And by the way, uh, the cutoffs, they cut away from where this is 0. So this is really a very nice function. So now if you stare at this thing for a little bit, you see that what's enough to show by Schur's bound is that the supremum over, and this is self-adjoint, this product, that the supremum over double y prime integral in, in this set, but that we're not going to really use that, the integral over this set, the absolute value of this guy, dy is no more than ch to the 2 beta. Because this expression bounds the norm of the operator. So that's a, on another st standard, you know, I don't know, even harmonic real analysis estimate. I call it Schur's bound, but it's, uh, you know, I, I know different people call it different things. So if, if, you have, if you have a bound like that, that gives you the, 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 the L2 to L2 norm bound. And so now what really is happening is that, uh, all right, so here, because I already uh, 
took the integration here and this I can remove this indicator functions and now what's happening is that we are integrating this expression over a small set right so I'm going to use the volume of the set you have to be a bit smarter about that because it doesn't is not this is not small everywhere but you just use the volume of the set and the pointwise bound on this that comes from the Fourier decay. Because if I look at this guy, this is really going to be like h inverse times integral over e to the i over h. Well, what's the difference of these phase functions? It really looks like y minus y double prime times something, some nice function of y prime, which depends on the two choices. But you know, I just f f factor it out. It's like the Taylor expansion. So that's going to be my phi. So I'll really have a, a family of phi's, but they, they are all nice uniformly. And then some phase of y prime. And then, well, originally you integrate it with respect to Lebesgue measure, but up to adding a certain power of h, you know, the Lebesgue measure on lambda gamma of h is really close, just taking the Patterson-Sullivan measure and convolving it with a unit interval measure. So this is really... Uh, I can really effectively, I can replace this with the integral by the patterson sullivan measure. You know, you need some work there, but th these are really, th these are not the difficult steps of, of the proof. And so now you see that this is really, this guy is my xi. And so what, what I get is that this guy is decaying like some explicit power of h, which can be computed here, depends on delta, times this y minus y double prime over h to the minus epsilon 1, which is this Fourier decay. And then I'm integrating it over a small set. So you, you, you know, a, a just, just a basic counting argument at this point will tell you that you can make it work with that value of beta. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip the explicit com com computation, but I, hopefully you'll believe me that this, at least you can see that the strategy of that proof is very direct. OK, uh, it's kind of in the line of what Federic actually mentioned in, uh, in some way, uh, that if you have Fourier decay, then you really have good properties. And then um, what I wanted to say is that, in particular, if we suddenly had the best possible Fourier decay, so the Fourier decay with delta over 2, so if our uh, limit set was a Salem set, then it's nice to see what kind of a fractal uncertainty principle would get, and it would be 1 half minus 3 delta over 4. So I'll draw that small graph here. So this is what the standard bound gives you. And if I put 2 thirds here, that's what this uh, best possible Fourier bound would get you. So you could really improve a lot. But not, not, not up to delta equals 1. But you could really, you know, you could prove a quite impressive quantitative improvement on the gap. Of course, I have no idea whether this is true. And if this is true, how one would prove that. But that's, you know, that's what the best Fourier decay would get you anyway. All right. So that's the um, that's this discussion of relation to fractal uncertainty principle and stuff. Of course. Uh, we, we treat them equally. Well, so this Fourier transform, I'm, I'm really allowing any phase function. So that's what I'm using. So my phase function really came out from the, the difference. You know, this, this was the difference of my two phase functions. And then I divide it. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, that's the phase function that you need. But, but we prove it for every. Oh, yeah, well, it's just going to be e to the i, i you know, it's, it's like psi is equal to k now, and phi of x is equal to x, and this is only on the limit set. So the limit set is already, you know, it doesn't touch the infinity of the line. So yeah, yeah, it's, it implies decay of Fourier coefficients too. Yeah, that's one consequence of that. That's right, yeah. It also implies decay of Fourier series coefficients. That's right. Uh, though that's not how we use it in, in that technology. So now let me uh, present the uh, main result that I will talk about today.
this is uh, another joint paper with Burgen this, uh, this, this year, um, which is the following. Assume delta is bigger than 0. Then, so we are still in this convex co-compact setting. Okay? Then we have this generalized Fourier decay, epsilon 1, for some epsilon 1, which depends only on delta and is positive. That's the statement. So except, well, delta equals 0, the Patterson Sullivan measures delta measure at two points. So that certainly doesn't have any Fourier decay. All other ones do have Fourier decay. And in fact, the exponent only depends on the dimension delta. So that certainly, is, as far as uh, Fourier or you know, fractal harmonic analysis goes, it gives you a nice piece of information that was not previously available. So that's something that would really be false for a linear counter set. And on top of that, it also gives you this improvement in fractal uncertainty principle, which only depends on the dimension, which also was not, not something known before. All right, so uh, in the rest of the time, I'll uh, try to explain um, how I understand the proof of that theorem. So the main tool is something that will be partially explained, or at least some components of the proof will be explained by uh, Elon Lindenstrauss this afternoon. And um, this tool is a decay of exponential sums. So let me state it first. So this is the version that we use at least. It's, um, I forgot, I think it's 08, but let me just, it's, it's the previous decade, I believe. So the version that we use is due to Borgian, but this really is in line with these uh, sum product theorems, which have been studied by a lot of people. That, that could be, but so yeah. So the, the specific version we use is in a paper by Burgen. That's, um, so it's the following thing. You take consider the sum. And so it's really a question of decay of exponential sum. So I'm afraid I'll just have to write out the sum and then explain all the terms in it. And then I'll talk a tiny bit about why I feel this theorem could be true. I mean, it is true, but I have to confess I don't know how to prove that theorem. So that's, uh, the proof exists, it's, it's, you know, it's published, but it's um, not, it's sufficiently far from my domain that uh, there is no way for me to comfortably understand how to prove that. So I'm gonna look at the sum and then here's my exponentials, my, they're complex exponentials. So you'll just have to bear with me for a moment. And I'll make the theorem a little bit weaker. We use a slightly stronger version, but I'm, I'm going to spare one constant. So this is this big sum. Now we have to define all objects. So what are we summing over? These z's are finite sets. And in fact, the size of each of these z's is like this nz, OK? So this is like averaging, right? So this is just going to be, I just take a sum over all of these values where this is varies in this finite set, this in this finite set, and that's basically the reciprocal of the number of entries in the sum. So I'll always try to write the sum as an average, just write the inverse of the number of terms here, and that somehow makes the bookkeeping a little bit faster. Now, what are these zetas? Well, zetas. Um, Map to well, one, one, two, or like that. So they shouldn't be close to zero and they should be bounded. And these have box dimensions. So I'm a little bit, I'm going to lie a little bit. I should really say a half somewhere here, but I'm just going to simplify this. And it's, you know, it will be a small positive dimension. So we don't really care if we divide it by two. We have a lower box dimension on the distribution of the zeta j's. So the way you should think about this really is that it's a discrete probability. In fact, the original statement is continuous probability, just the way I will use it is discrete. That you have these random variables where each zj is just the set of all possible outcomes. And zeta, uh, so th this is really my probability space with a counting measure. 
uh, counting probability measure, which is uh, corresponding to that. Zeta j is the corresponding random variable. So you have some random variables. And this is the mathematical expectation of exponential of i times eta. Eta will be large times the product of all of these guys. Okay, so that's what really, uh, that's, that's just an, it's just an expectation. It's a characteristic function of the product of these independent random variables. That's, I think, how people often think of that. Now, what does positive box dimension mean? Well, in my uh, language, in some discrete sense. Well, of course, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> the original theorem allows any probability measure, in particular, a discrete one. But it's really discrete versus continuous. I don't think that's a big difference here. I just I want to use the theorem exactly as it. I, I want to state it exactly as it will be used. So that's why I'm doing uh, it this way. And then I look at the square of the measure of neighborhoods of the diagonal, and um, that probability should be no more than, let's say here I'll where it nz minus 2 here. And then it's going to be some c0 sigma to the delta 0 for all sigma, uh, let's say, so here I cheat a little bit between uh, eta inverse and 1. So what this means is if you think about it in terms of discrete probability is I choose two points at random in one of these sets. And then what's the probability that they are close to each other? Well, it should decay. So if they're sigma close, it should decay like a power of sigma. That's all that this says. So a measure that doesn't satisfy, this is a delta measure. Imagine that all zeta j's were just the same number. Then this is not satisfied. And basically, any fractal measure, you know, any reasonable like, dynamical fractal measure, which is not a delta measure, is going to satisfy that, at least in dimension one. That's really, you know, your. This is just, it's, it's, a, it's a rather mild statement. It's like box counting. And it's, it just says that if you look at the, the probability that your value ended up at a small interval, it's a small probability. Hmm? Yes. So all right, this way I stated it's, a, it's an L2 statement. But yeah, that's right. It can be rewritten as an L2 statement. So what's the conclusion here? So we have these random values. And they somewhat spread out. And just in this very mild sense, they somewhat spread out. And then we write this exponential sum. So I just took these, I want to call them IIDs. They don't have to be identical, identical, but they're independent random variables. Then I multiply them. So I got some number. And then I take e to the i eta of this number. And then I, I take the expectation. So what, what's true about this expectation? Well, then, so here's finally the conclusion. If k is large enough, depending only on delta 0, Then this expression, sk of eta, is bounded by eta to the minus epsilon 2 for some epsilon 2, depending only on delta 0 and positive. So that's the, I, I believe that's a correct statement. I use a slightly stronger version, but that's not, uh, you know, that's really not the point here. Hmm? Uh, we have no, I personally have no idea. So the way this is proved is the following. You see, this gives you Fourier decay. So let's see what we cannot prove. What, what's false? You certainly cannot take k equals to 1 for, for just, a, you know, for an arbitrary value of delta. So you take the mid-third Cantor set, discretize it here. But again, the discrete thing is not important. And then. This is really the Fourier transform. And as I said before, it doesn't decay. So there are measures of positive box dimensions, even very nice delta regular measures, whose Fourier transform doesn't decay. Now what you could try to do is you could try to take a convolution of several of measures like that, the additive convolution. And that eventually, it might start Fourier decaying. If you take the mid-third Cantor set and if you convolve it with itself additively, I think you, you will start seeing some Fourier decay. However, you can make up your set in a rather nasty way by, say, taking a Cantor set with an alphabet, which is a larger arithmetic progression, so that this decay will, will be rather small. And maybe there are, you know, Alon might know that, but maybe there are examples of measures which, you know, no matter how many times you add them, they will still 
like decay. But certainly, you cannot expect still having decay like that. What's nice here is that we're not convolving things additively. We're not adding independent random errors. So we're multiplying them. And you could say, well, but adding and multiplying is the same thing. Just take the logs, right? The box dimension doesn't change. But what we're doing is we're taking the Fourier transform. And so the moral of the story is that if something has very, very bad Fourier decay, morally speaking, this means that the set or this measure has a lot of additive structure. But here, by multiplying a lot of these guys, we, in some sense, created a lot of multiplicative structure. And so the key component here, and I think that one will be presented by Elon, is the discretized ring theorem. I'm not going to state it, but roughly speaking, it says that a set, a subset of R, which is between, uh, you know, which has dimensions strictly less than, strictly bigger than zero and strictly less than one, cannot be a subring in any ap approximate sense. So any set between dimension zero and one inside of R it has to be substantially enlarged like by a power of its size, either by adding it to itself or by multiplying it with itself. So it cannot be approximately closed under both operations. And so what's uh, amazing to me about the statement is that, in fact, that's the only problem that could happen. So once you show that every set has to be enlarged by either additional multiplication, there is an argument that actually shows that you have this decay of exponential sums. All right, so this is, at, at least as far as I'm concerned, that's a very deep result because I have no idea, you know, I would not be able to, 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 to prove it my, myself. To okay, right, but the discretized ring theorem, you know, people study it and, yeah, yeah, it is, this, this, this one is due to Burgen. Oh, great, well then, uh, <laughs> yes, but that's right, because this really uses the discretized ring theorem, so, all right. So the rest of the talk, I'll try to explain how theorem 2 is used to prove theorem 1. Yes? There is no between and No. No, no, no. So you, you, you give me the dimension. Let's say um, I think uh, if, if delta was sufficiently large, like if delta was bigger than 1 half, you could maybe take k equals 2. Th there, are some, there are some statements like if the dimension was fairly close to 1, so then it's easier to prove. One over delta. I see. I see. So that's where it. Oh God. Well. Yeah, yeah. So no, nothing here depends on. Uh, oh no, no. On okay, k. Well, you fix you fix delta zero first. So you say how how small my dimension can get. So this delta 0 bigger than 0, it says, well, your thing cannot completely collapse to a point. Then I say, well, now from there, I can give you a number k so that if you multiplicatively convolve k times, then you will see Fourier decay. So k is dependent on k fixed. K is fixed. That's right. k will be fixed in the argument. And in fact, I will fix it right now. I will put, for my application, delta is enough to take actually delta 0 over 4, or think delta 0 over 100 if you, you don't want to figure out the exact numbers. and then. This is fixes k. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I just when I use when, when this argument is used, you just take your dimension delta of the limit set, you divide it by four. Turns out is enough, and then you carry it there, and that gives you k. So k will be fixed from now on. The size of eta is growing. Of course, so that's that's going to be used. All right, any uh, questions before I? OK. So, so now in the time remaining, let me explain at least some, give some intuition for how these two theorems are related. Because on the surface, they have nothing to do with each other. I mean, both of them have to do something with decay of exponential sums. But it's certainly not true that if you take a random point in the limit set with respect to the Patterson-Sullivan measure, it surely doesn't look like a product of IIDs in any, in any sensible way. You know, the, 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 the limit set itself doesn't care for multiplication of reals. 
right? This, this just has no, no multiplicative structure whatsoever. You know, multiplying two points in the limit set is a completely meaningless operation in itself. So one has to reduce one to the other, and that's, okay, I'm looking at the paper, and I should really be looking at the notes. And that's where, um, and that's where things will happen. So, um, so I will use Schottky representation. So I'll just, um, this is exactly what I drew on Wednesday, so I'm not going to be too precise. But let's say if for illustrational purposes, imagine that my thing had a you know, four, four, four disk Schottky group. And then I have these transformations. And I'm not going to use the complex disks anymore. It's really all, be, all going to be real now, like that. So we're using Schottky representation as before. So that's the part that I'll cut from the talk, presuming that it's already done. Now I need a bit of notation. So the set of all words. And what does this symbol mean? A, a arrow b means by definition that a is not equal to b plus r, where we had you know, where uh, these are in 1, ta, 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 2R. OK, so for each disk, you have this uh, other opposite disk. And then you, it's like, uh, it's like the, the free group, right? You just, you're not supposed to put a generator next to its inverse. So I'll um, skip over the detail of that. Now to each word, so these words I'll denote with vectors, um, I'll correspond an element of the group. And then to each non-empty word will correspond an interval, which I'll call like that, prime of i a n, where a prime always will be for me a1, ta ta ta, a n minus 1. So just removing the last element. Again, I'm just setting up notation. But it's, at some point, we'll, be, we'll have a long sum, unfortunately. And what else? Um, I say that you know, if I have two words, let me call it A. I will have the squiggly arrow, which will also help me. Yeah, this is just means it's very easy. It's just A1 is, and AN is equal to B1. So the, the two words, they, they share the last digit of this one is the first digit of that one. Okay, So that's, that's going to be, it turns out that concatenating words is actually much easier by just requiring that they share the same letter and then do, do, doing that. Anyway, so that's really um, OK. So now another piece um, of technology that I do need here is that I'm going at some point, soon enough, hopefully, I'll fix a partition, z, which is a finite subset of the set of all words. So the point of this partition is that we want to take a long power of the transfer operator. We want to take long words in the group. But word length doesn't correspond well to the length of corresponding intervals or to the size of the derivative. So we want to balance this somehow. So we want to, instead of taking all words of a certain length, we want to take a partition. So what does a partition mean? Well, one definition, it's a lazy definition, that it partitions the, the limit set. So here's an example of a partition, for instance. I could take this interval, this interval, this interval, and then this guy, this guy, and this guy. And of course, there is a tree theoretic definition of that, which is easy to figure out. So say so you just have this tree of intervals, because the each, you know, each, if you, if you start erasing uh, elements from the end of your word, your interval will just expand. So this is really a tree of intervals by containment, and then you just, wanted so that every infinite branch of the tree crosses exactly one element of the partition. So there is a definition for that. And why do I need this partition? Well, I will, um, you know, in my transfer operators, I will always put s equals delta here. So we previously studied more general transfer operators. Now I'll just use the transfer operator with delta. And um, so I'm going to define for each partition this LZ, which let's say maps continuous functions on the union of all these intervals. You see, it's a lot of notation, unfortunately, um, which is just defined the following way. Lz f of x is going to be sum of all 
a long words potentially a and c where a uh, is squiggly to b f of gamma a prime of x times some weight which is just gamma a prime of x prime to the power delta okay so that's the transfer operator just adapted to a partition and then <coughs> what's uh, nice about the patterson sullivan measure is that it's equivariance that I drew somewhere. Maybe I erased it already. Um, yeah, maybe I, I erased the equivariance of the Patterson Sullivan measure. But what it tells you is that the integral of f with respect to d mu is the same as the integral of L zf for any choice of c with respect to d mu. <coughs> I will spend a little bit more time on technical things when fixing parameters, and I'll draw a picture of what that means or how we're actually applying that. But you can write an integral of f with respect to the patterson sullivan measure by an integral of this, a lot of terms. And uh, each term basically only cares for value of f in one of the small intervals. So it's just, it's actually, you're using this basically to split the integral into pieces. And then each piece using equivariance can be put back to big intervals. Okay. So that's what, what we do need here, OK? Now, OK, so how does this work? Well, so going back to Fourier decay, we will let psi go to infinity. So psi will be very large. So this is the frequency at which I want to establish Fourier decay right now. And then we already fixed that number integer k from, the, uh, from this uh, theorem 2. And so I'm going to fix a small number tau as follows, that absolute value xi is equal to tau to the minus 2k minus 3 halves. Hopefully, we'll get to a point where this choice will pay off. So k was given to us by that theorem. It's a large but fixed number. And then tau is a negative power. It's a certain negative power of the frequency, OK? Now. Um, so which, what's the partition that I'm going to use here? So which transfer operator I will use? I will, I'm going to use the following. Z of tau. So that's going to be my partition. Z, which depends on tau. And that's just all words such that the IA is no more than tau and strictly less than I, the parent of A. So this is if, if any of you ever done, well, certain kinds of applied math, then you would just, uh, it's a very natural process. You just, you fix the star, which is a small number, and then I just want to discretize my limit set on that level. So I just go down this tree of intervals until all of the intervals, until barely all of the intervals are size less than tau. Okay, and that's easy to check that that's a partition. So that's the one that I will use. All right, so now, OK, so now comes the formula. So what we will use is the following. So we want this Fourier decay. OK, now I'm going to throw out G right away. So I'm going to be throwing out things that are easier to deal with to shorten the formula. OK, so I'll just put G is equal to 1. And I, I don't actually care whether phi is equal to x or not. It doesn't really help. Uh, so I'll keep the phi. Why not? Now, hmm? no, there is no. Well, I will linearize, but the the the, the value, you know, the choice of phi will will not make things any easier there. So what happens is the following: you can see that the integral over lambda gamma of e to the i psi phi of x. So that's I got rid of this g, whatever is going to be equal to the integral of lambda gamma. And then here goes my transfer operator, z. So this is z of tau to the 2k plus 1 of this function, d mu of x. OK. Now, what does this function look like? So I should really write it out. So um, well, it turns out that. You know, if I just took the first power 
of this thing. What does it look like? Well, it's, um, well, it would just be a sum like that there. So now I want to have a, maybe at this point I should draw a picture of what's going on. There, there is a picture that explains these formulas maybe better than the formulas themselves. But, um, okay, so what's happening here is that if I take a large power of the transfer operator, it just corresponds to the partition as just a concatenation of uh, 2k plus 1 words in the original thing. And so I'll have a formula exactly like that, but my word will be rather long. And so in this formula, the size of the corresponding interval is going to be about tau to the power 2k plus 1. That's going to be the size of the derivative, and that's going to be the size of the interval where this is mapped. So the picture that I think about is the following. Imagine that I had, let's say, my four intervals. These are the original four intervals in the Schottky thing. And then I'm integrating the function e to the i psi phi of x. Well, that oscillates a lot, right? Like that. And the scale of oscillations here is psi, which is psi inverse, which is tau to the whatever, 2k plus 3 halves, right? That's just the original thing. And then I want to integrate it, however, against a fractal measure. Now, you can see that. Now, imagine that I took, this is a difficult to draw, but imagine that I took these intervals here, like that, and these are intervals in z of tau to the 2k plus 1, basically. So these are the ones that will appear there. And those have size about tau to the 2k plus 1. So what this formula tells me here is that in order to integrate my rapid oscillating function here, I can just take each of these pieces, so each of these small intervals will correspond to exactly one term in the long sum that I'll draw. And then you can pull it back to one of the original intervals, whichever one it belonged to. And then here you would have e to the i xi, and then phi, well, I'll call it like that, but some element of a group of x. And this will be interval of size 1. And then we'll expand the whole picture by tau to the minus 2k minus 1. So what we get is something that's still oscillating, but only on the scale of tau to the 1 half. If you look at how the xi and the tau were chosen. So we just um, started with this rapid oscillating function, and now we're just isolating its integral into pieces. And each piece we stretch using this equivariance and write it as an integral of a much less oscillating but still oscillating function over a fixed sized interval. Now, well, how do we write these words? Well, it turns out that what's really helpful is the words here will really be concatenations of 2k plus 1 elements of the z of t. And it turns out that what's very useful is to split them into even and odd elements and treat them separately. Fix the odd ones and only sum over the even ones. And so that's what I will have to do. So this is going to be the sum. So I'll have to put in some notation. AB over capital AB such that whatever, whatever that means, I'll define that. Integral I B of A. And then here is going to be e to the i xi gamma of, uh, sorry, phi of gamma a star b of x. And now here, I should put the weight. Now I'm going to cheat here. So the weight in general is about the size tau to the 2k plus 1 times delta, which will match exactly the number of terms to the sum. So in fact, let me just put it here, tau to the 2k plus 1 times delta. Here are my weight. Of course, it's not constant, but I'm going to pretend like it is, OK? So I'm just going to, to throw the weight out and pretend that I'm summing that these weights there are constant. So a step is needed to get rid of that, of course. Um, it's, a, it's about the same as getting rid of the g there, like that. And what's the notation here? My a is going to be in z of tau to the 2k plus 1. My b will be in z of tau to the, sorry, to the k plus 1, to the k. So this will be a collection a0 a1, ta ta ta, ak. This will be a collection bz1, bk. 
then um, let me maybe, let's see, I, do I want this? No, I want to keep the picture. So let me do the following. Opa. Um, let me just go here for the moment. So A, like that B, means that we have this intertwining property like that. A, uh, B, J, A, J. And under this condition, you can merge them together. And so this is just the word that's obtained by taking a0 prime, b1 prime, a1 prime, ta ta ta, and then it ends at bk prime, ak prime, like that. So it's just a concatenation of a uh, 2k plus uh, one words. You split it into even and odd, and you somehow the the places where they merge, you treat as the last digit of the previous word and the first digit of the next word. So that's all. It's all there is. It's a bit of combinatorics. You can, you know, you can forget about this condition, you know, for, for the purpose of exposition. But that's that's what happens. So I just split the sum. It's a sum over a lot of terms, and that starts that start that's starting to look hopeful. Because you see that at least I have a sum that's starting to look like that sum over there. So my A's will be fixed, in fact. But my b's are going to be uh, are going to be uh, varying, and so I just when I sum over this capital b's with fixed a's, it's like I'm summing over the you know over over these in independently chosen things, and then I have something oscillating. So there is some hope of getting this decay to work. Yes. Yeah, I haven't reached I guess the point yet. I haven't reached the point yet, unfortunately. Yes. So here is, um, you know, at this point we still cannot, yeah, you, you don't see why, why, why what, what would be the reason for chopping things up into even and odd. And um, the reason is because, well, the proof isn't finished because this expression, it does look like e to the i xi, which is, you know, something that's good there. But then again, this thing still doesn't look like a product, right? It doesn't look like a product at all. So we have to linearize. And so that's what I'll do next. And that's where uh, some of these choices will start making sense. So, so what's going to happen here is now we have these long things. And um, have about five minutes to linearize. And it's not so bad, actually. We're, we're closer to uh, being done. Let me just uh, remind you here. I just erased it. Tau to the minus 2k minus 3 halves. OK, great. So now here comes a part that I personally found quite uh, mysterious, that it works. It took me some time to convince myself that it could make sense. But um, so here is the, OK, I think I'm getting here. All right. So now I'm going to estimate this integral squared. Why not? OK, like that. Now modulo this me, me, get, me getting rid of the uh, of the weights and getting rid of g. This is really just equal to what? This is just equal to well absolute value of this average. So again, I just put the re reciprocal of the number of terms. So this is sum over both a's and b's of this thing. So I'm just rewriting it. And then I should integrate it here. And um, right, d mu of x squared. Now you see, we would like to do the following. So we would like to use cancellations. See, we have a sum of a lot of oscillating terms. So this interval, let's say i1 or i2, whatever, i3. This one is i3, let's say. It gets each of these, you know, about one quarter of all of this play out of small intervals will give you an oscillating function there. So we're summing all of these functions pointwise, and then we hope that they will cancel each other somewhat. If they don't cancel at all, then you just get trivial Fourier decay or no Fourier decay. So that's what we want to improve over. We want to know that they somewhat cancel out each other. Well, the usual way to do it would be by studying their correlations. Except here, we, yes, is this thing. Yeah, it's this thing. 
So it's a long word, rather a long word. And yeah. So you want to, exp to get some cancellations. Well, what's the easiest way to exploit cancellations is by studying correlations. And that's why we wrote a square there. So we just want to know how much these things uh, correlate with each other or don't correlate with each other. And so <coughs> what's going to happen is you can really um, write it out well. Uh, so there is a sum and absolute value. So by Holder, so this is a, a seemingly at least trivial step. By Holder, because this is really like an average. you um, reduce it to this p of a, so the correct interval, whatever, e to the i xi, the same expression. This, is, uh, this didn't change. OK, so I, I just dragged the sum out. And that's OK, because it's just the average of values by holder squared is bounded by the average of the squares. OK. Now, when you look at this integral, that's where you can start using correlations. And so that's the same. So I'm continuing. Funnily enough, that part, in my opinion, is crucial to making it work. But it's, uh, it's like in between two lemmas. So if you, if you blink, you'll miss it in the paper. So here I'm going to have the sum. Well, let me sum over a's separately and sum over b's separately. And then you know this condition should hold, but I'll start erasing this now. And then sum over this i b of a squared. Well, integrate e to the i xi phi of gamma a star b of x minus phi of gamma a star b of y. This is big. B, B, B of A, oh, I forgot to say. B of A is just last letter of uh, A, J. So this is B of A. Uh, K, sorry. So this is really a big interval. So this is, this is the interval over which the fixed sized interval over which all of this tau to the 1 half scale oscillating things are integrated. So we got to this point. So this is just an identity, right? I just wrote the square, it's for b. Now, um, so what's going to happen now is a bit funny. So this correlations, well, at this point, you would like to integrate by parts. right? If mu was a smooth measure, then you would see that maybe if x and y are far enough, and m most x and y are at least somewhat far enough, you can integrate by parts and use some derivative. Of course, you cannot do this here. So you, what you do instead is I'm going to replace, change the integral here to the sum. That I can do. And then uh, here I can, you know what, this sum so I'm going, for lack of time, I'm going to do the following. This is the average over a's. I'm just going to take the maximum of this. These are all non-negative things, so I can afford to do that. OK, so I'm going to fix a from now on. It's not quite right, but for most a's, you can make the argument work, and that's enough. And now if I look at this guy, well, so here comes the funny step is that, uh, right, the sum over a's, of course, I still have this. Uh, average thing. <coughs> now what's going to happen is the following. I'm just going to bound it by this absolute value, like that. Like that. So at this point, I completely give up on cancellations of the phase of this big sum between different values x and y. So I just take the absolute value. And now I just have to really analyze what is this expression. So the sum over b, this is the sum to which we'll eventually apply, well, hopefully sooner rather than later, because uh, time is, uh, has run out, basically. But this is the sum to which we will apply theorem 2. So I'll write out the sum, and then you'll see why this, this expression actually looks like a product of IADs. So that's not, now you see, you, you have a chance, because it's a difference of two things. 
And that's something that uh, can be approximated by the derivative, and the derivative satisfies chain rule, which gives you a product. Now, specifically, what is this phase there? So what, what's the phase there? Well, it's going to be phi of, and here I have to start writing, gamma a0, gamma b1, ta ta ta, then gamma, it ends with this, gamma bk, gamma ak of y, right? Minus phi of, well, the same expression, unfortunately. Let me just, uh, like that, of, uh, sorry, this is x, and this is y, like that. Now, OK, we fixed a's. We will be summing over b's, but we really fixed all a's. Which means that these two are just, uh, you know, these, are, these two are just two fixed numbers that really just depend on x and y. So they are not, you know, they really be independent. So I'm going to call this x tilde, and I'm going to call this y tilde. OK? And then I can see that x tilde minus y tilde, well, generically, so for most choices, it will be on the scale of tau to the delta. Sorry, of, of tau. Because they are both in the same a, uh, ak interval. Right? So these are two small points, which is good. So the derivative thing could work. Now, by the mean value theorem, let's say, I can write it like that. It's going to be phi prime of some, let's say, called x0. Then it will be gamma. Let's say I'll put these together. Again, it should be primes, really. You should remove the previous terms always, whatever. Of x1, ta 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 ta, gamma bk, uh, well, gamma ak minus 1 prime, bk minus 1 prime of uh, xk. So I'm almost done here, times x tilde minus y tilde. That's an exact formula. This is just the mean value theorem, where I specify that my x0 is in, so each xj is in i aj, like that. Because it's, you know, it's going to be gamma this guy of something. OK? So you get this big product. That's an exact formula, except, of course, the choice of this x case is going to depend not only on x tilde and y tilde, but also depend on b's. And we're summing over b's, so that would be bad. We cannot do pointwise things there. But what happens is, let's see how big is the whole thing. Well, the real phase is, of course, xi times that. Right? And now let's observe that this thing is like tau, right? Each of these guys is like tau squared, so I'm going to, yes. Right, because this is really, sorry, these are all derivatives, of course, <laughs> derivatives. So this is like tau squared because I have a kind of a doubly tau sized word. And so if we put, and this is like tau to the minus 2k minus 3 halves. And uh, th this is, of course, of size 1. So we see that here we have all of this stuff is going to get us tau to the 2k plus 1. So this thing is on the scale about tau to the minus a half this whole product, as it was before. That, that makes perfect sense, right? Now, let's see. What happens if we just replace this xj's, which are somewhat arbitrary, with, with xj, which is fixed, which is just center of iaj? Well, what happens? Well, we just need to wiggle this a tiny bit. In an interval, this has size tau. So if we wiggle this, for example, guy, in an interval of size tau, well, what's the relative change? It will change by about tau uh, relatively to its, uh, to its original size. So this means that this whole expression will change by about tau to a half. And that's where a half is useful, finally. And so this is going to get us error tau to a half, which we can remove because we just need some decay. We, we're, we're not greedy. And so now you just have this expression where you put Finally, zeta j is going to be equal to gamma a j minus 1 b j of x j. Can you again explain this last point? You can replace x j with the center. With the center. But x j was varying. So again, a's are all fixed. That's why fixing a's is useful. 
So these are all fixed. Now I'm going to replace xj, which is an arbitrary point there, by the center of the interval. Well, this means that in each of these pieces, this thing might wiggle by size about tau, right? Well, this means that this whole expression, if we change one of these parameters by size about tau, and the expression had, uh, had a scale, you know, it had size roughly tau to the minus a half, it means that this whole thing will change only by tau to a half. And so your phase will change only by tau to a half, which means, of course, that it, it's really tau to a half plus the original thing. And so that gives you an error. So in the sum, you know, the sum is really like the average. And so that, that gives you an error that, that is decaying as xi goes to infinity. So this error we just throw out. So we do this replacement. We bear this error. And now we see that we have exactly a sum that we can use on theorem 2, where this guy is just some fixed number now, because x, x0, you know, again, we fixed all a's. So for each a's, we'll sum over b's. This psi times blah, blah, blah times uh, this guy, this is going to be our eta. So our eta will be of size tau to the minus a half, in fact, because that's the effective uh, size of this whole uh, oscillating phase. And most of the time, x tilde and y tilde will be far from each other. So that's mo most of the integral will be quite large. And uh, in place of these derivatives, you just get these zetas. Sorry, these zetas. And if we look at them, once we fix A, we fix this guy. And this was the center of IJ, so we fix that guy too. So we're really only wearing this thing. So they're independent. They only depend on BJ. And then you can show, so using the, the fact that we had a nonlinear non group of transformations, you can show that CJ has box dimension, well, for example, at least. So that's a separate argument. But it has box dimension at least delta over 4. So how do you think about these zeta j's? You just think about the following. I go back to this tree. Right, 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 right. The tau squared, sorry. Tau squared. Yeah, that's right. You, yeah, you want to normalize everything, yeah. So how do you think about the zeta j's? Imagine I have this big tree, and I want to change, I want to, let's say, take a random element of my random element of my, uh, you know, with respect to Patterson solid measure, well, I go down a random path in the tree, and a Patterson solid measure tells me how, you know, how I choose my probabilities. And then uh, what happens is, basically, this is just the, the dilation factor. So at some point, so I fix some point where I started, that's this xj, and then I fix how far I'm going in. And I just say, what's the derivative? So locally, how much dilation did I see? It's always on the scale of here tau squared, but how much relatively did I see? If you had a linear Cantor set, then the dilation is always constant. And so you would just see a negative power of 3. And that doesn't have positive box dimension. That has zero box dimension, right? But for these sets, you can, you can check it more or less explicitly. So there is an extra argument needed here, of course. But you can check more or less explicitly that for these nonlinear transformations, when you go down, you're, you're not going to see the same dilation factor all the time. And that's really all that's needed. And that gives you this positive box dimension, which you then wedge here. You get this rapid decay of this guy. And that's, of course, the, the stuff that, that we wanted to uh, estimate anyway. All right, sorry for running over for the last time this week. And uh, thank you. <laughs>